together in the likeness of his death, we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. Now if we be dead with Christ, we believe we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, being raised from the dead, dieth no more, death hath no dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once, but in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Uh, notice Paul's talking about how you're dead to your flesh, and your flesh is dead to you. Uh, two people that are dead should not be able to communicate very well. Um, if you're communicating a lot with a dead man, you've got issues, and you've got a spirit working in you that you're allowing to work. And he said that if you're dead, you're freed from sin. Um, so he's comparing those two. Look in verse 11, likewise, reckon, notice that word reckon, it'll be a key word we'll talk about. Reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let not sin therefore reign your mortal body. That means you give it permission. You allow it. Let can either be a command uh, to do something or it can be permissive to allow something. Let not sin therefore reign your mortal body that you should obey it in the lust thereof. Neither yield your members. Yield. That's an option. Voluntary. Your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin. But yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead. And your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. For sin shall not have dominion over you. Keep in mind there, verse 13 is talking about your members, your, your physical members, uh, your body. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law but under grace. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law but under grace? God forbid. Know you not that to whom you yield yourself servants to obey, his servants you are to whom you obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. Notice again it's saying it's a free will, it's a choice. Um, you do have a choice in whether or not to sin. Um, but God be thanked that you were the servants of sin, but you have obeyed from the heart that form a doctrine which was delivered you. Being then made free from sin, you became the servants of righteousness. I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity, the sickness, the illness of your flesh. For as you have yielded your members servants to uncleanness and to iniquity and to iniquity, even so now yield your members servants to righteousness and to holiness. Notice it's all optional. It's all uh, will. You decide to either yield to righteousness, holiness, it's all decision to be made. For when you were the servants of sin, you were free from righteousness. What fruit had you then of those things whereof you are now ashamed? Uh, for the end of those things is death, but now being made free from sin and become servants to God, you have your fruit and holiness and the end everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Um, I talked last week just about your body, soul, and spirit. And I broke down Romans 6. I talked about how uh, it's key to understanding what he's talking about in Romans 6 is identifying who you are. A lot of people, they don't know who they are. That's why you have people that have literal, uh, they change their identity, they change their sexuality, they literally have identity crisis. Um, a lot of times a man or a woman, especially men, whenever they go to retire and quit working, uh, they have a, almost a little crisis in their life because they identify with that job. They believe that job is who they are. They believe it's a part of who they are and they don't know, they don't know, uh, they don't know what they're going to do with themselves afterwards. So we broke down the body, soul, and spirit, and it's important to know those three things. Um, if you're going to understand uh, who you are as a person, who you are in Christ. And then I broke down the word baptized. We went through the seven different baptisms uh, that you'll find there in the Word of God. We talked about that some. Um, I'm not going to go back through those again. Uh, but again, if you, keep, if you ever just get, get one verse that you highlight to give to somebody that believes in water baptism, I would try to remember Romans 6, 4 and just ask them, say, is that a physical baptism or a, uh, a water? Is it a water baptism or is it spiritual? Just ask them. If they say it's a literal baptism, then say, well, what about the baptism into his death? Is that a literal baptism too? Did you die? Did someone come up and shoot you the day you got saved and baptized? No. So it's not a literal, physical water baptism. It's something else. And then you can kind of get into the idea of it's not water baptism that saves you. It's a spiritual baptism. We talked about all that last week. I want to, uh, I want to pick up this thought. Did I tell you all about the story about that man uh, who was a prisoner, Reynold, the duke, and his brother kept him prisoner inside of a room? Yeah, he kept him, okay, I won't go through all that again. He's talking about his flesh. Uh, basically, there's a man named Reynold. He's a duke back in the 16th century and uh, a duke of Belgium. His uh, brother, Reynold, uh, ended up revolting against him, captured his brother Edward, and he took his brother Edward. His brother Edward was overweight and always had a problem with his weight, and he had a special room built uh, there. Well, he had a room in the palace, and what he did to the doors is he made the doors just a little bit smaller than the normal door, and uh, he made the windows a little bit smaller than the average window, enough to where he knew his brother couldn't fit out physically. He couldn't squeeze through in any way, and what he did was he kept, it's a, it's a, it's a true story, I mean, according to history, I don't, I don't know, I mean, unless you just throw out all history and say none of it's true, um, it, uh, but he said his brother just kept bringing him food and bringing him food and bringing him food. And uh, the man ended up not getting out for 10 years um, until his brother died. They came and freed him. And they said by the time he got out, he died within a year because he was just so, he was so overweight and ate himself to death. But my point is this. He was a prisoner. Yeah. 
he was a prisoner. And he wasn't a prisoner to his brother. They came up to the, uh, the Edward, his brother, and said, why in the world would you do that? It's sick to do to your brother. And he said, I'm not keeping my brother hostage. He himself is choosing to be a prisoner. Um, now, he would create a stumbling block for his brother, but still the point is that his brother was a prisoner to his own flesh. My question for you is, is who's the prisoner? Uh, you got to decide if your flesh is going to be the prisoner or if you're going to be a prisoner to your flesh. And I, I mentioned it, I believe, last week, but you ought to go by every now and again, go to that old man that's sitting there in a cell that's waiting his execution, your flesh, and just rattle his cage every now and again. Do something to make him mad. Fast, uh, pray, witness, uh, do something to get your flesh uh, uh, just to put it down. So we talked a little bit about that last week. and. I want to talk more about sin today and, and, and living a, a holy life and uh, getting victory over sin. Um, and I wrote this down in my notes, but if you want to live holier, you have to quit helping the old man up. If you want to live holy and righteously, you have to quit helping the old man up. Quit helping him get up onto his feet again. I wrote this down, wake up every day and have his funeral. Get dressed, halfway decent. It helps you, by the way, if you get dressed. Um, if, if you're working from home or you're doing virtual classes and different things, it helps get you in a, in a mindset whenever you get dressed, put on clothes, and wash your face. It actually helps you mentally get, uh, be more prepared for the day. Get dressed every day. Read some scriptures and pray. And tell your old flesh you'll miss them. It was good knowing you. It was good while you were here. You, you know, you're a good man and, and this and that, but uh, I can't be with you anymore. You're dead. You're gone. And uh, bury the old man. Move on with your life. Wake up every day and have a funeral. Chapter 6 of Romans is telling us who we are and who we can become, and he puts it all out as a choice. And chapter 6 teaches you that you do not have to sin. You do not have to sin. And chapter 7 is going to teach us that you will sin. Um, Chapter 6, John Wesley took it to... uh, uh, Help me. Sanctification. Uh, What's it called? John Wesley took it to... uh, Sinless perfection. He believed in sinless perfection. John Wesley believed that if you woke up every, up every day and you prayed for four hours, you read your Bible for two hours, you went and witnessed for three hours, and you preached for four hours in the afternoon, you came back home and you fasted for four hours after preaching, and you went and preached again that night, and you, you prayed that night, then you could, you could go without sinning. Uh, you could literally not sin at all, never sin again. Now, that is foolishness. It's one extreme. You have one extreme that says, man, I can never sin. I just talked to a man. I'm, I, I told you all, I, uh, one of our neighbors there, and he told me, he said, I don't sin. He said that uh, he believes he doesn't sin anymore, despite the fact that he was cursing, dropping F-bombs in front of me and has alcohol and everything else. Uh, he doesn't sin anymore. You say, Aaron, well, those are just two sins. Yeah, they're two sins I can see and hear, so they're easy to point out. Um, they're real basic. Um, I'm sure that he has other sins inside of his heart that he doesn't know about. But John Wesley took it to the idea of you don't ever have to sin. The problem is, is that you can't wake up a, 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 a single day without sinning somehow. There's sins of commission and sins of omission. Um, but chapter 6, and I'm going to get into that more at the end, but chapter 6 is teaching us that you have a choice in the matter. And a, a Calvinist and a liberal will take it to one extreme and say, well, we all know that we're going to sin, so it's all right. No. Um, Dr. Ruckman put it this way, if you're going to spill something, that's fine, but make sure next time you tighten the lid. You're going to spill something throughout your life. You're going to sin and mess up. Just make sure you try to tighten the lid down. The problem is today, no no one wants to tighten the lid down. Um, So chapter 6 is going to teach us that it's a choice. We have a choice in the matter. And I want to talk about that a little bit. Notice the key words in chapter 6. Death, dead, died, dieth, and sin. 11 times in that chapter. Yeah, for which one? I counted seven times of death, seven times dead. I could be wrong. I counted died once, but you can check me on that. I counted dieth one time and sin 17 times. It's a lot. It's a lot. Yeah, the point is it's a lot. Uh, shows up again, death seven times, dead seven times, died one time, dieth one time, sin 17 times. And it's the most positive chapter for us. Look over in John chapter number 12. You say, Aaron, that doesn't sound like a, a positive chapter. Well, it is, I promise you. John chapter 12. Um, as someone once said, you ought to be positively negative. Amen. Have a good balance. People say, Aaron, are you positive? Yes, I'm positively negative. Amen. Uh, John chapter 12. Uh, chapter 6 of Romans is one of the most positive chapters for you, and all that it talks about is dying and death and sin. Uh, John chapter 12, verse 24, and this is why it's a good chapter for you. It's why it's positive. Verily, verily, verse 24, John 12, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a corn of wheat fall to the ground and die... It abideth alone, but if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. He that loveth his life shall lose it, and he that hateth his life in this world shall keep it unto eternal life. So it looks like Jesus Christ is saying the key to success, the key to getting victory in your life is to fall, to die, be alone, and to hate. 
That's what the verses say. They say, except it die, abide alone, uh, uh, and hate. He said, unless you do that, he said, you're not going to have eternal life. And, and he's not talking there, by the way, about salvation. That's a good example of uh, eternal life, life eternal. That means more to life, and uh, more in eternity, getting rewards, eternal crowns, eternal blessings, inheritances, and different things. Uh, not inheritance, but getting rewards at judgment seat of Christ. Um, that's what the life there eternal is talking about. Uh, so my thought is this, our, our eternal life comes from the death of Christ. Our abundant life comes from dying to self, submitting to God, yielding to God like Romans 6 says, dying to our own uh, desires, our own will, being alone with God. He said it only abide if it, abi- it has to abide alone. And then it says that you have to hate. And you say, well, what all do I have to hate? Well, you have to hate sin and selfishness in your own life. Every now and again, you should wake up and say, man, I can't stand you. Not to your spouse or to your kids, to you. You ought to say it to you. Um, my biggest problem in my life is me. It's not my wife. It's not my child. It's not my, it's not my job. It's not anybody else. It's not the culture. It's not the brethren. My biggest problem is me. And whenever you get to that place where you say, man, I hate, he says, you hate your own life. Uh, I, I, I hate what my flesh is made up of. Then you can start moving forward. Uh, go back to Romans 6. I want to give you these uh, five thoughts. This is from Brother Peacock. I want to talk about the, the steps to sin. The steps to sin. And uh, most of this, I, I don't know if I edited any of this or not. And, um, but it, honestly, it just helped me so much that I, I'd, I'd feel bad if I didn't share it with you. Um, the steps of sin. How does sin come into your life? How does sin come into your life? If you notice, Romans 6 keeps talking about reckon. 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 You reckon? Yeah. Uh, yeah, he, bless God, he let him have it. No, uh. But the, uh, it talks about reckon. Reckon means to add up. It means to figure. It means to apply, to count, to subtract, to divide, to place things. Reckon means to figure out. And then notice he keeps saying, no. Know ye not? Know ye not that as many as, as, many as us were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into death, knowing this, that the old man is crucified with him, knowing, knowing, knowledge. Uh, so Paul's wanting us to learn something about sin, and he's wanting us to learn uh, characteristics of sin. And uh, I want to give you these because I believe it will help you. Number one, sin usually comes in this manner. It usually starts with a presentation. A presentation. Sin is offered to you. It's offered to you. Presentation. It's presented to you. Eve had that tree, and she saw that tree and saw that it was good for food. It's presented to you. The, the sin is presented, uh, and it usually comes in the form of a thought. Your thoughts are about, they, your thoughts are, you have a 0.001 second. That's a millisecond. And your thoughts actually are faster than that. Your thoughts run at about a quarter of a millisecond. That's how fast your thoughts are. So within that, not even a split second, within a quarter of a million millisecond, uh, you're having a thought where uh, an idea is presented to you and you said, I can either do this or I can't do it. And then you're illumina- uh, there's illumination on it. So Eve saw the tree and then she had illumination on it. Her conscience, the Holy Spirit, God said, hey, Eve, don't eat of that tree. Remember what I told you? Remember what your husband told you? And uh, she uh, is given light on it and the Holy Ghost and the con- your conscience will give you light. And neither of these stages are sin. Uh, when our sin is presented to you, whenever the thoughts presented to you, whenever there's illumination and the Holy Ghost says, hey, don't do that, it's, you're not sinning yet. The sin comes in at, at number three whenever you begin to debate on it. I bet, I, I bet you anything, if I know Eve, I bet you anything. This is what she did. We know a little bit about the conversation between her and Satan. I guarantee you she was talking to Satan and thinking in her head saying, did Adam like misspeak whenever he said don't eat of it? I think he misspoke. I mean, did he, I mean, because it wasn't God telling me, it was Adam that told me. So maybe he didn't say it right. Maybe it, it was Adam that just didn't tell me right. And would God be that extreme to say, kill me? And she began to reason in her head saying, I've never seen death before. I've never, it doesn't seem that bad. I've, I've never seen death before. It, it, just, it seems like maybe something was lost. She began to debate. Whenever you begin to debate, you're, at that point you're sinning. At that point, you're taking the Holy Ghost, the conversation he's having with you in your conscience, and you're saying, yeah, but I don't think it's that big of a deal. I don't think it really matters. I think it's just. An, I think the man's just exaggerating. I don't think I really need to follow this. You begin debating whenever that sin uh, comes up. At that point, you should repent and apologize for even considering it. But then, what, after the third, uh, after you begin to debate, you'll make a decision. And nine point nine nine times out of ten, you're going to decide against God. Uh, you're going to decide to go through with the sin after you've been debating, and you'll likely go against God. And then uh, the fifth step to sin is death. Death. Uh, James 1, uh, 
James 1, I believe it's verse 14, But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin when it is finished bringeth forth death. I know a lot of you know that. Um, but we already talked about how death can be spiritual or physical. Um, let me give you just a couple of quick scenarios of uh, how this will come up in, in your life. And folks, this I'm not talking to any of you. This is just me, okay? This is just an open confession, so don't think I'm targeting any of you. I'm just going to give you these quick examples, okay? Everybody good? So I'm not targeting anybody. You go to a fellowship at a church, and they have a whole bunch of food out there on the table. And you think, I can eat all that food. I can eat three or four plates. I can eat dessert. I can drink the sweet tea. I can drink the lemonade. I can drink the coffee. And the Holy Ghost says, or your conscience says, hold on. Hold on, Hoss. Uh, please don't do that. Uh, you know you're going to be sick if you eat it all. You know that you're going to feel sick to your stomach. You know that you have a long drive back. Don't do it. You're going to be tired. You're going to be fatigued. Your blood pressure, your blood sugar is going to go up. It's going to be blurry on the road. Don't do it. Uh, be a good example in front of other people. You're supposed to have control of your body, soul, and spirit. You're supposed to be disciplined. You're a disciple of Jesus Christ. You're supposed to have your body under subjection, your mind under, under subjection. Just don't do it. You can just eat a little bit. Just eat one plate. Just eat one plate and enjoy it. That's illumination. And then the, the debate comes. And you say, yeah, but it's free. And we're not supposed to waste because he that is a uh, he that is uh, uh, his brother he that is slothful is a brother to him that is a great waster. And we're not supposed to waste money. And this is all free. So technically, Lord, I should eat this because I would be saving money I would normally spend on the way home. So I can't be a waster. And then on top of that, Lord, you know how I love food. <laughs> and no one else. <laughs> She's talking in tongues over there, sister. Uh, you know how much I love food, and no one else loves food like I do. I just have a problem. I'm the only one in the room that loves food and loves to eat. No one else likes food and sweets and cakes and cookies. And you begin to debate and say, Lord, I want to be a good steward. Uh, Lord, it's really not that big of a deal. And then you think, well, everybody else does it. Look at the pastor and the evangelist. You say, Aaron, I'm not, you say, Aaron, you're pointing fingers. No. Look at the pastor and the evangelist. They're doing it. Can't we do it? Everyone in America is doing it. Can't we all do it? You're debating. And at that point, you've already made your decision. Mm -hmm. You've already made your decision yeah. whenever you're on the first plate that you're going to go back and get a second, third, and fourth, and fifth plate. Instead of just eating until you're full and feeling good about yourself, you're going to debate. You made a decision, and then you bring forth death. And you say, Aaron, what's the death? You feel sick to your stomach. You feel shameful. Uh, you feel guilty. You broke your, your diet, whatever it was. And you say, Aaron, uh, who are you talking to? I'm talking to me. I struggle. I struggle with that. I like to eat. You may not believe it, but I like to eat. And it catches up with me the older and older that I get. I found out all my muscle that used to be up here and it used to be the reason why. This, this shirt I used to fill out. This is a 16. I used to fill it out because my neck muscles and traps and shoulders. I found out it all just collects down here slowly. Gravity. And gravity takes over. And, uh, I'm not, and I'm just pointing that out to you. I'm just saying that's a simple example of how something can be presented. And within a split second, you're making uh, illuminations brought to you and you debate. And then you make a decision and it brings forth death. Let me give you a second example. And again, I don't think any of you ever struggle with this. This is just my own stuff I'm giving to you. Uh, and I don't, I'm not going to look at anybody specifically. But your loved one says something and they're wrong. And you're tempted to correct them. Because you're right. And they're wrong, and the Holy Ghost says, shut your mouth. Mm -hmm. Number one, you don't have the right spirit, so don't say it to them. They're not going to receive it the right way. They're not in the right spirit to receive the truth that you're going to give them. Uh, they're going to take it the wrong way. You're going to make them feel ashamed. You're going to embarrass them in front of other people. Uh, that's going to be in the back of their mind now. You're going to cause division and strife between you. Don't do it. Just don't say it right now. You can say it later. Just don't say it right now. And uh, a word uh, spoken in due season is like apples of gold and pictures of silver. And at that point, you haven't sinned. But you begin to sin whenever you say, but Lord, you're a God of truth. Oh. And Lord, I couldn't imagine not speaking the truth whenever I know. I know what's right. And they're wrong. And they need to know that they're wrong. So you're debating at that point. You're debating and you're saying, no, I'm going to tell them that they're wrong. Whether it's a coworker, whether it's a boss, whether it, whoever it is, whether it's somebody's making you mad. Lord, I know that they're wrong. And you're debating at that point and you've already you've made your decision and then you're going to bring forth death. And you say, Aaron, what's a death? Strife, division, contention. Uh, you're, going to, you're going to shame that person. The fellowship with them is going to be broken. Uh, and it brings forth death. And you're developing a bad habits in both those situations I gave you. You're developing bad habits. And uh, that's how sin comes. It comes in those five stages. Presentation, it's illuminated to you. And then you debate and you begin to make a decision. Um, I want to go over uh, five steps to overcome sin. Five steps to overcome sin. Um, 
I'm just trying to give you practical things uh, that happen from day to day, and uh, hopefully you can use it uh, and break it down for you. And uh, five ways to overcome sin in your life. And I don't know what sins you struggle with. I know I just mentioned two of them. I believe every single person in this room struggles with those things. Um, five steps to overcome sin. Number one, you've got to know. These are going to be pretty basic, but they're going to come from the text. No, you got to reckon. Uh, you got to know, you got to reckon, you got to yield. Pray and fast. Confess. Repent. And repeat. This isn't from a textbook or anything, and uh, they may not seem very profound, but uh, it's just something that I. I think will help you. Number one, know some things. Know some things. The word no comes up four times in Romans 6 in chapter, in verse number 3, no comes up. Uh, verse number 6, no comes up. Verse number 9, no comes up. Verse number 16, no comes up. And you say, what does no mean? Well, if you go to the Greek and the Hebrew, what no means is to learn. It means to learn some things, to re, uh, retain some knowledge. Uh, and one thing that I, 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 uh, I, I know to be true is that uh, a lot of us don't like learning. Or let me rephrase this. We don't like learning what we need to learn. We'll learn something ignorant, something, something that's out there, something that uh, feeds our appetites for knowledge, but we don't want to learn things. How many of you know somebody that knows a bunch of foolish junk? I just spoke to a man last week that told me all kinds of stuff, and I, the whole time I'm thinking, dude, I'm looking at these different, he, can't, he has problems in his life, he's struggling with sin and different things, and he's telling me all this stuff that's going on with the Ukraine and Russia, he's telling me all this stuff that's going on with uh, the abortion clinics and all this sick stuff that they're doing, all these different things that they're doing. And the whole time I'm thinking, you don't know what you should know. You don't know what you need to know. Uh, and people don't like to learn. You know something they're finding out now with new grads from college? They're finding out that they don't know how to think. I've noticed that a lot. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> uh, that's the goal. Yeah. Right. What they're able to do is they're able to, you, if you give them, you say, no, reckon, yield, pray, fast, confess, repent, repeat. And you ask them on a test, say, what were those five steps I mentioned? They would say, no, reckon, yield, pray, fast, confess, repent, repeat. And then you'd say, all right, how can you use those five things? And they go, you didn't teach us that. They just learn to regurgitate stuff. They regurgitate things and to pass the exam. That's why they're all anxious because of the exam. They don't know how to actually take the information and apply it. And they're finding out in the clinics that it's scary. Because you're getting these therapists that they know the textbooks, and I can, I can testify to that. There's a lot of girls in my class that they all got better grades than me. They're all smarter than me. They're all, they all can retain it better. They all got better grades than me, and they stressed a whole lot more about their grades than I ever did. But whenever we went to the clinic, I was able to talk to people. I was able to, whenever I didn't know what I was talking about, I was able to make them think I knew what I was talking about. Because I was able to, even though I didn't, maybe I only got three of these five, but I was able to use the three that I got. And my point is this, as a, as a Christian, you need to be able to apply the things that you've learned. I, it doesn't matter if you know about dispensations or not. If you don't know how it applies to you and how to witness to somebody, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you're a King James Bible believer or not. If you don't know how to apply that to your relationships, it doesn't matter. And I've said this before, and it usually goes over like a lead balloon in other places, but I think you all agree with it. But uh, God could really care less if you're a King James Bible believer. If you don't have a good relationship with your, your spouse and your children, why would God care? Right. If you don't have a good relationship with other people, why would God care? If you don't have a good testimony, why would you care? Um, yeah, it might make them more mad. Uh, my point is this, is that an average Christian, they have a pitiful witness in their life. They have a weak walk with God, and it's because they're living off someone else's spirituality, teachings, and standards. Yes. Yes. If you learn the Bible, if you learn the Word of God, you'll get some standards and convictions of your own. Now, I was talking to people about this the other day. We were talking about how to... Um, standards and convictions that people have and you say wearing their traditions and this and that uh, you are a makeup of people that influenced you and the Bible says uh, seek ye the old paths uh, it says to remove not the landmark that your father said over there in Proverbs um, Paul told Timothy he said uh, Timothy said and the things thou hast learned uh, knowing of whom thou hast learned them um, he's talking about the men that taught you things Timothy and I'll say this to completely throw out everything that old men of God have taught us and their standards and convictions is foolish, and that's a liberal ideology. Uh, I'll give you. I'll just give you a little example, okay? And don't anyone, y'all just just think about this for a second. Don't say anything out loud. But uh, you've all probably heard people in our circle say they can't stand people that wear earpieces. 
They say, well, that's liberal and, and this and that. Uh, they can't stand that. They can't stand crosses with lights behind them and different things and, and whatnot. Those are all little standards and convictions that people have that in the grand scheme of things don't really matter. Yeah. Amen. Um, I don't really care if a man gets up and speaks with a little thing earpiece because I go to college where they speak with earpieces. So it doesn't bother me. You know, back in the day, the, the, the microphones that they used to have, preachers, were, were long, skinny microphones like this that were connected to a wire. Yeah. Yeah. Well, why don't we get back to the old past? Bless God. I ain't going to let some man get up there with a little earpiece and talk, you know, preach to... Well, how old past are you want to go? Are you just going back to the lapel? Because before that, it was a, it was a thick mic where, like, that they hung like this and they'd carry it around. They had a cord and they'd walk around like this and preach with it. What, what old past are you talking about? Um, people talk about, uh, and I, I could go on and on, um, uh, with haircuts and everything. Yeah, you can go with them. Um, I can go on and on, but the point is this, if you get to the place where you're saying we need to throw out everything, we need to throw out the dress clothes, we need to throw out the haircut ideology, we need to throw out the music ideology, we need to throw out the lapel ideology, we need to just throw everything out. Whenever you get to that mentality, you are then taking the mentality of what we would call liberal or a compromiser in the fact that you're, you need to have that mentality of there are some things that the old men, the old path, uh, the old path has taught us and there's peace in that. There's peace in just not changing everything. And what, whenever you have churches that throw out everything, that's whenever you fall into apostasy. Um, so my point is this, a, a lot of Christians, because they don't learn, um, because they don't learn uh, the Word of God on their own, they don't have, they don't have convictions and, and standards of their own, they're just going off somebody else. Uh, so my point is this, learn, to know. You say, Aaron, how does this have to do with, with, uh, with the five steps to victory? Know some things, learn some things. The Bible says a wise man uh, lay up knowledge for himself, meaning he saves it. Um, learn how to learn. It's something different, ain't it? Learn how to learn. It blows my mind how many people don't know how to actually learn. You can get online right now on YouTube and type in TED Talks and type in something like ways to memorize, ways to study, ways to read. And they will lit speakers will get up and tell you ways that have been proven to infect your retention, uh, your memory, uh, the way that you can, you can speed read through things. Uh, learn how to learn. Uh, write as you read, look up words you do not understand, find out what they, they mean, ask questions, uh, sleep on it, go to bed studying something, wake up the next day and then pick it back up again uh, uh, with a fresh mind. Uh, Brother Aaron mentioned it there a while back, but you can listen to something on two times speed yeah. where it's played back faster. Yeah. They found out that if you listen to the same speech twice, um, but you listen to a uh, faster playback, uh, you can retain it better. My point is this, learn how to learn. Uh, I know it sounds modernistic and everything else, but just Google <laughs> TED Talk, how to learn, and you'll probably find stuff that'll, that'll teach you how to learn. Uh, there's nothing more dangerous in this world than sincere ignorance. There's nothing more dangerous in this world than sincere ignorance. People say ignorance is bliss. Ignorance is not bliss. Ignorance will hurt you. Yes. Uh, not knowing uh, what, how sin comes up in your own life, not knowing how to identify it, not knowing how to get victory, it'll hurt you. And uh, it scares me how many people are just ignorant. Number two, uh, how to get victory over sin in your life. Number one, know, learn some things. Number two, reckon. Reckon. Uh, to reckon, it says down there in verse number 11, Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. The word reckon means to number, to count, to figure, to set in order. And it goes back to what I mentioned. Apply what you've learned. Apply what you've learned. Put it together in a way that you can understand and use it in your own life. My job as a pastor... And any man's job as a pastor or teacher is to take the gold of the Word of God and to melt it down and then give it to you so you can mold it into whatever you need. Uh, my job is to take the Word of God, make it practical, make it not just practical, but uh, make it where you can understand it, where you can use it in your own life. And then I give that to you and then you take it and you mold it however you need. What happens a lot of times is the preacher will try to just give you something that's already made and say, here, use this. But it doesn't work in your house. It doesn't work in your home. It doesn't work for your family. I can give you my standards. I can give you my convictions. But that gold, you got to have that gold and you make it what you need. Um, but that's my job. Figure out where you are weakest spiritually and what sins tempt you the most. And develop an action plan towards it. Um, I don't know if any of you ever heard of this before, but um, there's something in, uh, in management called the five whys. The five whys. Five whys. The idea is, that, uh, is a way for you to solve problems. If there's an issue going on, uh, you, can, uh, you can solve the question by asking, why did that happen? Somebody says, uh, man, I just really stink at this. And you say, why? And they say, well, because um, I'm too slow. And then you say, why? And they say, 
Well, because I, I don't exercise enough. And they say, why? And you say, well, I don't, I don't have a gym. And you say, why? And then they go, I don't know. The answer is to get the gym then. Get the gym membership, get a treadmill. But you keep asking why until you find something that you can start working with. Um, and we're, t- we're talking about sin, under, getting to the why of why something happens. I, I was reading, there's a monument over in Washington, D.C., and they actually, they use this method on. There's a monument that was costing hundreds of thousands more to power wash than the other monuments. I, can't, I couldn't find the name of it in my notes. Um, but it was costing hundreds of thousands more to power wash. And, the reason, and they, so they started asking, why are we spending so much money cleaning this monument? And they said, uh, they started talking to the, the groundskeepers and everything, and they said, because the pigeons keep defecating on it. And they were thinking, so that's why we have to power wash this thing, because pigeons keep defecating on it. Why do they keep defecating on it? And they found this out. They found out, they go, we found these, this, this spider, the species of spiders, that's, that's here in this area on these plants more than anywhere else, than any of the other monuments. These, these specific types of spiders are not anywhere else. They're just on this monument. And they said, why are those spiders there? So they started, they kept researching and they found the, they said there's this little black beetle with like a greenish tint on it. And they said, this little black beetle isn't around any of the other monuments. It's just around this monument. And they said, why is that beetle around the monument? And then they said, they said, this beetle, they're attracted to light. They have a stronger pull towards light than any other of the animals. And uh, they, so uh, they said, well, and then they figured this out. They figured out that the lights we're on two hours longer on average at this monument than any of the other ones. And they found out what it was. The simple solution was to turn off the lights. They were spending hundreds of thousands of dollars because they kept the lights on on this monument two hours longer on average than any of the other monuments. And what they did was they kept asking why. Why are the pigeons defecating on it? Why are these spiders here? Why is this beetle here? And they found the answer why is because the light kept being on. So they just thought we just turn off the lights two hours sooner and it saved them hundreds of thousands of dollars. And whenever you're dealing with sin in your life, don't just go, man, I just can never get victory on it. Just say, why? Well, because I always do it. Why? Well, because every time I'm in this situation, the temptation comes up and I give in to it. Why? Well, and keep asking yourself why. Break it down and figure out why. If you're going to get victory over sin, number one, learn. Know some things. Number two, reckon. Reason. Think. Um, I, I, I told you this, but so many people, man, they just come and they just sit there. And if the preacher says, hey... You ought not to do that. They go, amen. You ought not to wear that. That's right. You ought not to be that way. That's right. And they leave and they go home. And they didn't find that from the Word of God. A man that they love and respect said that. And folks, that's scary whenever you're in a situation. That, that's, that's apostasy. So my point is this. Know some things. Learn some things from the Word of God. Get your own convictions that are not based on some other man. Get your own convictions that work for you. Uh, and uh, uh, learn how sin comes into your own life, how you're tempted. Reckon, figure out the base cause of it, and thirdly, yield. Yield. The word yield comes up five times in Romans 6. Servants comes up eight times, and the word serve comes up one time. So know some things, learn, study, reckon, think, and then thirdly, yield. The heart, yield just means to submit. And I'll say this, the hardest job in the world is to submit. Is to listen. The hardest skill and the hardest discipline is to listen. Um, you know what you have to teach kids to do? You have to teach them to sit and listen. Yeah. And it's hard. Oh, yeah. um, but you know people that get paid the most usually in society are people who sat and listened to their teachers. That. And that's just the world system. Right. The world system has it set up that the people that are going to make the most money are going to be the ones that sat and listened in high school, sat and listened in college, and then they're going to get the jobs that they want to get, where they want to get it, with the benefits that they're going to get. Those people that learn the skill of sitting, listening, and submitting. Sitting, listening, submitting. It almost, I think it rhymed, but like I said, it's hard. I can't tell you how many things in school I've thought, this is the dumbest thing I've ever seen. I should not have to write this paper. I should not have to read this article. I should not have to turn these things in. But you know what I do? I submit to it. And if you're going to get victory over sin in your life, you've got to know some things, you've got to reckon some things, and then you have to submit to it. Romans 6, 17 says, You have obeyed from the heart that form a doctrine which was delivered to you, meaning obedience is a heart issue. And I'll say this, folks, uh, you have to be obedient to your, your bosses. You have to be obedient to those in the church that have rule over you. Uh, you have to be obedient if you a, a, uh, have a spouse and uh, you're a woman. You have to be obedient to your husband. You as a child and as an adult with parents have to be obedient to your parents. I don't care where we are. I don't care if we're at a family reunion, if we're at church, if we're out shopping, if we're out at a restaurant. My dad still has authority over me. 
as long as it doesn't go against me and my wife and our marriage, it doesn't go against me and my home. My father, if he says, Aaron, could you do this? I have to listen to him. He's my, he's, I'm, he's my boss. He's still my authority. And I understand once you get married, you can come out from the authority of your home. I understand those things. A woman, uh, she comes under the heading of her husband. I, I get those things. My point is this. You and I need to learn how to follow and we'll never be great leaders until we're great followers. And I'll just throw this out there to you just so you understand. Some people are really hard to follow. Some people make it really easy to follow them, and you can jump in right behind them. The key is to find somebody that you can follow and you can lead under that person. A person that's not a good leader cannot develop other leaders because he will not let them lead. And as they begin to grow as a leader and their own skills begin to grow, they, their own walk with God begins to grow and God starts moving them in their life, what happens is they begin to butt heads or nudge into that other leader. And what it is is they're trying to flap their wings, but there's not enough room for it. And God is trying to get them out of the flock. He's trying to get them to move on because their wings are getting bigger and they're getting stronger. Uh, there's a, th a law uh, called the, uh, uh, J.C. Maxwell calls it the law of uh, limits the, or the law of the limit of leadership. The idea is this. Um, if you have a bunch of leaders all in your church, some of them are, if you count 10's the best leader, one's the worst leader, and you got all kinds of different leaders uh, in your church, um, what will happen is this. Everyone is going to follow the strongest leader. So if the strongest leader in your group is an eight, everybody's going to go and line up under number eight. Now what will happen is one of these people may end up changing and they may become a nine. They may grow, they may develop, they're going to become a nine. You know what that nine's not going to be able to do? He's not going to be able to follow number eight anymore. He's going to look out for a ten. And he's going to follow a ten. And uh, you say, Aaron, what are you getting at? Some people just make it easier to follow them. Uh, but my, my advice to you is this. Find somebody that you can follow and you can lead under them. And you can lead other people under them. Uh, my job as a pastor is not to bottleneck you. My job is not to tell you how to do all these different things. And I, I'm not to hold you down. I'm not to, you don't have to come to me every single time that you want to buy a car, every time that you want to go to the grocery store, every time that you uh, want to do this or do that. You don't have to come to me for everything. I have to rule well the, the church and the congregation. Um, but I, I, it's just not my approach. I'm sorry. I couldn't care less what kind of haircut you get. I, could, I, I really couldn't care less. I, I, I don't care what kind of clothes you... I, I don't care about those things. I'm going to preach and teach the Word of God. If God doesn't give you the standards and convictions, I'm not going to get up here and harp about it. You mean I'm going to get a nice haircut? Good. I'm not going to say that on record. Oh, you said a nice haircut? That sounds good. Yeah, yeah. I was expecting you to say something else. Uh, it's not sinful, no. Uh, but the folks, the thing I'm getting at is this, is that I'm trying to change your mentality because your mentality is the same as my mentality. We were taught... Um, Brother Greg Estep, I love him to death. I listen to a lot of the stuff that you're getting out of the book of Romans is from Brother Greg Estep. A great man, a great man of God. He's going to have so many rewards at the judgment seat of Christ. They're going to outnumber me. I really do not compare to him in any way. Uh, but he, uh, my dad called him Pope Gregory. He churched his own mom and dad. Uh, he called him Pope Gregory. You wouldn't buy toilet paper for the church without him knowing and that's just how he was, and he taught that. He, he taught six hours in his Bible Institute. I took it on the ministry. He taught six hours on um, pastoral authority. What? Jack Hiles. Yeah, his Jack Hiles type stuff. Um, he taught six hours on pastoral authority. Look, I'm, he can have his own convictions, and he's allowed to do that. And he taught other people that we know how to pastor. My point is this. That's not me. I, I have too much of a life. I have too much of my own things to be concerned with to where I'm going to tell you that you have to do this, you have to do that with your kids, you got to do this. I, I can't do that. I, I'd wear myself out. I'd wear myself out. Um, and, and that's just not my style. And, and I hope you, you understand that. The, it's not that I'm, I'm not laissez-faire. Brother Aaron talked about laissez-faire leadership. Laissez-faire leadership is you let problems arise without taking care of them. Yeah. That's, that's not what I'm... Laissez... Hands off... And the tr like the true form of hands off in a good sense is that you get the people to where they're doing so well at the job they're able to work without you to where whenever you're not there they're good right. they don't miss a beat they're working on their own they're able to cr uh, problem solve on their own they're able to uh, put forth the extra effort they're able to get the job done they can operate without you being there so then you're hands off uh, my job is to be hands off your personal lives and hands on in the word of God and prayer that's my, that's my goal. Um, so the point is yield, submit. Some people just make it easier to submit than other people. But for victory over sin and death, Romans 6 teaches us that we have to know some things, we have to reckon, and we have to yield. And ultimately, I made that about man, but it also comes down not just to yielding to man and governmental authorities, 
uh, which we are, we're not against the government. Um, if they want to chop our heads off, they're allowed to, according to Romans 13. Um, but we need to obviously yield to God. And uh, he says that all throughout the chapter, that who you yield yourselves to, his servants you are, whom you obey, whether sin unto death or being unto righteousness. And uh, it goes on and on. So you've got to yield, uh, yield, give in, submit. Um, fourthly, uh, what do you have to do? And there you say, Aaron, this seems too simple. Pray and fast. I'm not going to go through a whole lesson on prayer and fasting right now, um, but I will say this. Uh, Jesus Christ said, This kind cometh not forth but by prayer and fasting. I don't believe there's anything more powerful than prayer and fasting. And you say, Aaron, you know, what about the Word of God? I don't believe the Word of God has power without prayer and fasting. Um, I, I know so many people that they, they know the Word of God inside and out, and their life is dead and dry, and their preaching is dead and dry. It's because they don't have an intimate relationship with God. I can know everything about women that I want to know, and I can take all the human development, family studies classes, all the biology and anatomy classes. I can, name, I can literally name hundreds of bones in my wife's body. I can name the blood, a lot of the blood vessels. I can name a lot of the tendons and the joints and everything. I can, I can know all that in my head, but if I don't know her personally, it doesn't matter. And you can know this book inside and out. You can know everything about it, and you can know, bless God, you've been getting it preached to for years and years. You can know all that, but if you don't know the one that wrote the book... It doesn't matter. And you don't know that other than through prayer. Through prayer. It's what keeps your heart soft. It keeps your eyes watery. It's what keeps you on fire for God. It's what keeps you from uh, not drying out. It's prayer and fasting. Fasting is what gets a hold of God. It gets God's attention. I'll teach you eventually on fasting out of Isaiah 58. Um, but fasting destroys that flesh, that carnal nature that we were talking about. It makes you healthier. It creates discipline in your thought life and your appetites. And uh, you and I ought to pray continually, the Bible says instantly, fervently, and always. The Bible tells us to pray that way. Continually, instantly, fervently, and always. And I wrote this one down too casually. You say, Aaron, what do you mean? Uh, your prayer life ought to be different at different times. Your communication with God ought to be uh, change uh, based upon the circumstance. But Samuel's walking over there in 1 Samuel 16. He's walking to anoint David without knowing it. And it says he, begin, he begins to talk to God. And he says to God in his heart, he says, Surely the Lord's anointed as before me. And God says, No, the man looketh on the outward appearance, not as God seeth. But what it is, is he's talking to God casually. And if I can just give you one tip on your prayer life, it's this. You ought to have long bouts of prayer and short bouts of prayer. You ought to have times where you set aside with God, maybe every month, once a month, maybe once every two months, once every other week, whatever it is, whatever you can do. Or you pray to God for an hour, two, three hours if you can. Um, where you get alone with God and spend that long time with him. And then you ought to have times all the time where you're praying, you're talking to God just early in the morning. You, you pray for 5, 10, 15 minutes. Um, you know, I, 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 hate, <laughs> I hate when I hear people say this, but they say, when was, you know, you don't pray for 30 minutes every morning? Well, no. You work 40 hours a week and got a kid and a wife and a job and everything else? No, you're a full-time evangelist or pastor. You're supposed to pray for at least 30 minutes. <laughs> at least 30 minutes every day. That's like, that should be like a warm-up for a, a full-time minister. Um, but my, my point is this. If you think, I always relate back to a spouse and kids. You ought to get away with your spouse and kids every now and then for a weekend. Every now and again, you ought to get away. Um, and you ought to get away with the Lord every now and again for an extended period of time where you make yourself sit there and talk to Him for an hour, two hours, give, give Him a whole night. Um, but pray fast. If you want to get victory over sin, pray and fast. Thirdly, confess, repent, and repeat. Confess, repent, and repeat. I put all those together um, my point is, I don't know what to tell people about sin other than just confess it to God, repent of it, and keep doing it until you get victory over it. Um, too many people let it beat them down. They're not getting victory over something, and it literally holds them down, and it becomes a stronghold. And it's not the sin that's a stronghold. It's their attitude about the sin. It's the attitude of, man, I'm never going to get victory over this thing. This thing keeps tearing me down. This thing keeps wearing on me. And their attitude about it is what becomes a stronghold because whenever the sin, the temptation is presented, illuminated, and all that, they've already, there's not even any debate anymore. The sin is just presented. The illumination might be there, might not yeah. be there, and they're not even debating anymore. They're just, they've already made the decision to say, hey, I can't get victory over it. Yeah. I can't do it. Um, Hebrews 12, when it's talking about bitterness, it says, lest any root of bitterness spring up and there, many there might be defiled. You know what the context is? It's the chastening of the Lord. Hebrews 12 is where he's talking about uh, every son whom he loveth. He, he, scor he scorches every son whom he loveth. 
And then it's talking about bitterness. It's talking about living righteously and the fruit of righteousness is peace and different things there. If you read Hebrews 12, that bitterness, that, within the context, I know you can be bitter about a lot of things, but it's talking about being weary in your mind and putting aside that sin which does so easily beset you. And it's saying, hey, don't get bitter over the fact that you can't get victory over something. And that's why I said if you, if you want victory, confess, repent, and repeat, and don't get weary over it. Um, I tell people this too, that the Bible, Hebrews 12 says, let us lay aside every weight of the sin which does so easily beset us. Um, sometimes whenever you're plowing a field and you come to a stump, you're trying to plant a garden, and you got a stump, you have to make a decision. Am I going to spend all day long trying to get the, the stump out? Or am I just going to go around it and finish the rest of the garden and get the seed in and come back to that stump tomorrow or the next day? And there are sins in your life. I'm sorry, I know a lot of people don't teach this, but I believe there are sins in your life that you're not going to get victory over them now and you just need to move on and God will show you other sins that you need to get victory on. And you can come back to that sin later. It'll still be there. And I found this out. If you did a little bit of digging... I don't know really anything about gardening, but I, I have taken up stumps before. If you do a little bit of digging around that root and you leave it for a couple days or weeks, that sun's going to hit those roots and dry it out. And what happens later, ooh, I'm feeling kind of good. What happens later is you come back to that stump and it comes out a whole lot easier. True. And in your, whenever you're doing a sin in your life, sometimes you got to say, God, I, just gotta, I, can't even, I can't even pray over it anymore. I can't fast over it anymore. I can't cry out to you anymore. I'm just going to go on and work on whatever else you have for me. And you might come back to that stump later and it's already been taken out. Or you might come back to it and it comes up a whole lot easier. Um, so if you want victory over sin, know some things. Learn some things about it. Listen to good preaching, good teaching. Uh, uh, get standards and convictions that are your own. Reckon, reason, think, apply it. Yield yourself to God. Uh, yield yourself to who God's put in your life. Pray and fast over it. Confess, repent, and repeat if you want victory over sin. Those are five steps to victory over sin. I'll close with this thought. Um, chapter 6, if you could summarize it, uh, what its purpose is, it would be, uh, the purpose would be just getting victory over sin. And you can be a servant to righteousness in verse 18. You can be a servant of holiness in verse 19. You can have fruit in verse 22. And you can have everlasting life in 22 through 23. So he's telling you the purpose to get victory over sin in Romans chapter 6. He's telling you to get victory over it. And then he gives you the purpose in verses 17 through 23. You can be a servant to righteousness, a servant of holiness. You can have fruit and you can have everlasting life. That sounds like to me a pretty good deal. Sounds like a good deal, having those things. And fruit can be all kinds of things. Having fruit, he said, you have your, uh, uh, you become, you have your fruit into holiness. You can have love, joy, peace, long-suffering. Galatians 5, those are all fruits. Uh, Philippians 4 says, fruit that abounds to your account. He's talking about money that you give. And 2 Timothy 2 says, I endure all things for the elect's sake that they may obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. He's talking about eternal glory, meaning rewards and crowns. Um, but my, my point is this. You can bear forth fruit. You can bring forth more fruit. And who wouldn't want those things in their life? Love, joy, and peace, long-suffering, meekness, faith, and temperance. And a lot of times we think of this. Whenever we hear Galatians 6 preached on, Galatians 6, 7, and 9, we hear, Be not deceived, God is not mocked, for whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. If he sow to the flesh, he shall have the flesh reap corruption. If he sow to the spirit, he shall have the spirit reap life after everlasting. Uh, uh, and he says, Let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. I guarantee you the majority of times you've always heard that preach taught, or that verse taught, uh, you know, if you sow to the flesh, you're going to reap corruption. And it's taught from the manner of, of sin. And that's fine because that's in the text. But you know what Paul highlights? He highlights sowing to the Spirit. He says, let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. He's saying this, you always reap more than what you sow. Bad, yes. If you sow to the flesh, you will have a lot of things to pay for it, but you will also reap more if you sow good. And you can sow good. You can make good decisions and you will reap more. Um, chapter 6 says we do not have to sin. We sin because we want to. And people, a lot of people say, well, I can't ever be holy. I just can't live holy. And that, 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 you know, I'm, I'm wicked. I'm worthless. Whatever. And I ask people this question. Can you not sin for one minute? Could you go one minute and try to not sin? Okay, good. Next time go two minutes. And then three. And then four. We don't have to sin. We choose to sin. We can do right. If we, if we want to do right, we can live as holy as what we want to live. Chapter 6 is the ideal Christian life. It's the expectation. And chapter 7 is the battle. It's the reality. 
Paul's going to say, I know that in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. Whenever I do good, evil is present with me. There's a, a law in the, my members warring against the law of my mind, bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? He's saying, I do mess up. I do fall. After preaching one of the most uh, distinct, one of the most definitive chapters on complete victory over every single sin and how you can get it, Paul says, but just so you know, I have faults and I mess up. Chapter 6 is the, the expectation. Chapter 7 is the battle. And chapter 8 is the answer. The idea is this. <laughs> Try to be perfect, but stop trying to be perfect. Yeah. Try your best to be perfect and stop trying to be perfect. Realize that you do need to try to get victory over sin and then also realize you're going to mess up and you're going to falter along the way. You know, I use Michael Jordan as an example because he's an alcoholic and everything else, but fornicator and gambler and whatnot. But, and, uh, but he, uh, I was watching a th highlight on him the other day and it was game six against the uh, 1988 Celtics, I believe. And uh, game six, man, they, they do best out of seven. And it was... Um, Two, the Celtics were down two to three in the series, so uh, the Celtics are up by two, I believe. And if they win this, they'll go to a game seven. Michael Jordan, who everybody loves, and everybody said he had the most grit, and he just didn't quit, and he always took the last second shot. He goes to dribble down the lane with about five seconds to go. He does a crossover move like this, and then he goes to the middle right at the free throw line, and he falls down, loses the ball. They, the Celtics take the ball and throw it to the other end of the court, and the buzzer rings, and they lose the game. He fell down the last five seconds. Of the, Michael, I mean, Michael Jordan, the, one of the best basketball players of all time, fell down the last second of the game. And you know what they did? You know what he did? He went out to game seven and he won game seven. My point is this. He fell, but he got back up, and that's why people loved him. And people will remember you not just for falling, but they'll remember because you got back up. Amen? So try to be perfect, and at the same time, don't try to be perfect. Amen? Let's all pray. Uh, dear Lord, we love you. Thank you, Lord, for loving us, God. And uh, thank you, Lord, for being so good.